We are jumping into Esther chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at this theme, right? Seeing the unseen. Before we read our text, I just want to make you aware of a couple of unique aspects about the book of Esther that are worth mentioning. Esther is one of only two books in your entire Bible that's actually named after a woman. If you're wondering the other one, you don't have to look very far right after this, after Esther comes Ruth, the other book named after a woman. Now, Esther is a unique book in that it was actually challenged for quite some time whether or not it actually belonged within the Scriptures. There was a challenge of its rightful place in the Bible, and this is due to the fact that as we go through Esther in all ten chapters, what you will not see even once is the name of God. The name of God is not mentioned once in this entire book. There's no Adonai, there's no Yahweh, there's no Elohim anywhere within these pages. In fact, this book does not only not mention God's name, it doesn't mention that His hand is at work at any moment. It doesn't mention His law referenced. It doesn't mention faith in Him of any kind. Yet the God who seems concealed on the surface of this book is clearly seen when we give a deeper look. No, none dare call this book a story of coincidence. This, my friends, is a story of providence as you step back and look at Esther as a whole. And although God's name may not be mentioned, His fingerprints are on every page of every chapter that we read. This is a work of God that needs no introduction because His reputation is well known, and there is no doubt upon studying it that this is the authentic work of God. My hope as we go through this study is is not only that you would gain a greater understanding of the book of Esther as a whole, but that you would gain a greater appreciation for and recognition of the work of God beneath the surface in your own life as well. That although there may not be a moment that God rips open the sky and says, this is my son or daughter in whom I'm well pleased, that there are these moments when we look beneath the surface and dig a little deeper where we can see God's hand clearly at work and His fingerprints on our story. Those moments where God guides guides our lives ever so gently. He orchestrates these divine meetings for us to take place in, and He swings wide these doors of progress through tiny hinges of simple obedience in difficult moments. This is what we'll see as we study through the book of Esther and we learn how to see the unseen. Well, join with me in Esther beginning in verse 1. Here's what we read. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This was Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, that in the third year of his reign he made a feast for all his officials and servants, the powers of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him, when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days, 180 days in all. And when these days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all the people who were present in Shushan, the citadel, from great to small, in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white and blue linen curtains fastened with cords of fine linen and purple on silver rods and marble pillars. And the couches were of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of alabaster, turquoise and white and black marble. And they served drinks in golden vessels, each vessel being different from the other, with royal wine in abundance, according to the generosity of the king. In accordance with the law, the drinking was not compulsory. For so the king had ordered all the officers of his household that they should do according to each man's pleasure." 
Queen Queen Vashti also made a feast for the women in the royal palace which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing her royal crown in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials, for she was beautiful to behold. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command brought by his eunuchs. Therefore, the king was furious and his anger burned within him. Then the king said to the wise men who understood the times, for this was the king's manner toward all who knew law and justice, those closest to him being Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Miris, Marcina, and Memucan, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who had access to the king's presence and who ranked highest in the kingdom. What shall we do to Queen Vashti according to the law, because she did not obey the king of Ahaz- King Ahasuerus brought to her by the eunuchs? And Memucan answered before the king and the princes, Queen Vashti has not only wronged the king, but also all the princes and all the people who are in the province of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will become known to all women, so that they will despise their husbands in their eyes. When they report King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought in before him, but she did not come. This very day, the noble ladies of Persia and Media will say to all the king's officials that they have heard of the behavior of the queen. Thus, there will be excessive contempt and wrath. If it pleases the king, let a royal decree go out from him, and let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it will not be altered, that Vashti shall come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she." When the king's decree, which he will make, is proclaimed throughout all his empire, for it is great, all wives will honor their husbands, both great and small. And the reply pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the words of Mimucan. Then he sent letters to all the king's provinces, to each province in its own script, and to every people in their own language, that each man should be master in his own house and speak in the language of his own people. Let's pray as we begin this morning. God, we come and approach your word, eagerly desiring to hear from you. Lord, we thank you for that reminder this morning that even in the darkness of the clouds, the gloominess of the day, your light shines forth and proclaims your glory and majesty and power. And Lord, even as we look upon this dark scene we see within Esther chapter 1, the wickedness within it, the selfishness and pride within it, Lord, we pray that your light, your glory, and your majesty would shine all the brighter through it. We thank you for the rain you've brought, Lord. We pray you would continue to do so to help quench these fires and give strength and energy to all who are fighting these fires on our behalf. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the freedom we have this morning to read it, to study it, and to proclaim it freely. Would you be glorified this morning in our study? And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, if you're taking notes and you want to write down a title, you can write this down this morning. A kingdom built on sand. A kingdom built on sand. And why do we use this title? Well, it's taken from something Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 when He's speaking to the disciples and giving them all these commands for how they are to live the things they are to do, the ways they are to obey Him. And He first begins by saying that 
that you'll be blessed if you hear and do these things, and you'll be like a person who builds their house on a rock, and even when, when the storms come and the winds come and the waves crash, that house will stand and remain firm. But then he says this, he says, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Now, what we see in Esther chapter 1 is an incredible kingdom, a powerful kingdom, a wealthy kingdom. But what appears to be an unstoppable force of unending riches and power will slowly begin to crumble from the inside out. What looks like a strong and firm foundation is truly a kingdom built upon sand. And as the storms begin to come, it slowly begins to fall. And though this will all take place within just ten chapters of this book, we have to remember the time frame that all this takes place in is twelve years. This didn't happen in a month. This was a long period of time. The events we're going to read about through all of the book of Esther are actually taking place between chapters 6 and 7 of the book of Ezra, if you're familiar with that. This is after the first return of displaced Jews by Zerubbabel and before the second return of Jews back to their homeland led by Ezra. This is in between both of these departures. And the first character we're introduced to in the book of Esther is this king, and many times what seems to be a clueless king, but it's King Ahasuerus. Many of you may be familiar with him by the, the title he's better known as in history, which is King Xerxes. King Xerxes. He was the, Persian, uh, the king of the Persian Empire, and at this time a man with an unmatched power in his day. He's the son of Darius the Great, the grandson of Cyrus the Great. And although it was truly under his father Darius that the Persian Empire reached its peak power, Xerxes was the one that finished building the palace construct in the city of Persia, excuse me, in Persepolis, the capital city of Persia. It's interesting, his father had built within that foundation, this place for an inscription, and yet died before he ever had anything inscribed in this place. And so along comes Xerxes, King Ahasuerus, who feels the need that he needs to fill that area with an inscription. And when we read the inscription found on this foundation stone, it gives you a good understanding of the kind of king he was and how he viewed himself. Here's what that inscription said. I am Xerxes, the great king, the only king, the king of all countries which speak all kinds of languages, the king of this entire area, big and far, reaching all of the earth, the son of Darius, a Persian, son of a Persian, an Aryan of Aryan descent. This is how he viewed himself, the king of kings. Of all the earth, the ruler over everyone. And even as his father has built this massive kingdom that he just gets to step into, he feels the need to write an inscription glorifying himself and his power. Xerxes was tyrannical in his leadership and especially cruel for those he conquered. And this is the king ruling in our text in a book where we're going to see God do an incredible work. His kingdom, which we read was in Shushan, maybe some of your translations say Susa, the citadel. What's interesting about this location is that excav excavations have revealed that the description of these specific places within the palace in the book of Esther that we read were accurately described by someone who had to have had intimate knowledge of the palace. And they know this because of a French archaeologist, Jean Perrault. Jean Perrault served as the dig dict uh, director 
at Shushan for over a decade, more than 10 years, he was the director over this archaeological dig. And in 2012, before he died, this is what he said, one today rereads with a renewed interest the book of Esther, whose detailed description of the interior disposition of the palace of Xerxes is now in excellent accord with archaeological reality. That as he spent more than a decade digging up this site, here's a Google image for you of that very location still today. More than 10 years of his life spent digging up this site and looking at each and every area of this palace only to say that we have an excellent account of it given to us in the book of Esther. And I love it when archaeology and science and biology begin to catch up with Scripture, (laughs) begin to say, oh, you know what? Everything you read in there is actually totally true. It actually gives us a perfect and excellent account of everything that we're seeing as we begin to dig it up. This is the palace we read about today. And the first thing we read about King Ahasuerus, King Xerxes doing within this palace is putting together the biggest, most extravagant feast you will read about in all of Scripture. Now, there's an assumed goal within this 180-day feast, and that was to bring all of these officials, all of these officers of his army, these rulers together to plan and convince all of them of his plan to invade Greece. This is a plan that would be carried out between chapters 1 and chapter 2, an invasion that's well known within history for the Battle of Thermopylae, a well-known battle within history, but also um, many people are familiar with because of the movie 300 that had come out to depict one of the battles, this battle of Thermopylae. This battle where an army of 300,000 Persians and King Ahasuerus or Xerxes was met by a Spartan king, Leonidas, and his army of 7,000 that would prove to be a costly battle for King Ahasuerus. But we'll talk about more of that next week in chapter 2. But this feast that takes place for 180 days is strategic to bring all of these men that are in authority into his palace, to show them the riches he has, that he can afford to make such a quest to go and try and conquer Greece, to show the power that he has, the people at his expense. This is strategic first to convince them, but also to plan this invasion. We read the riches of His glorious kingdom that He is showing these people, but you have to ask the question, don't you, just how rich was He? Well, when Alexander the Great conquered the city and destroyed it, he took away all that was of value to him. And a Greek historian, Plutarch, records that as much coined money was found that it took 10,000 pairs of mules and 5,000 camels just to carry it all away. That's how much gold and valuable coin he had in his possession. 10,000 pairs of mules and 5,000 camels just to be able to carry it all away. This man was wealthy beyond measure. And this was both an invitation to those he brought in as well as a warning to any that would defy him of his power and authority. This is a moment he brings everybody in who might want to question who's in control to remind them and show them and even bribe them if necessary that he's the one in power and that they would do right to get behind him. But what does he do after 180-day feast, displaying all his riches and power before all these officials? He carries out another feast because 180 days just wasn't quite enough. So he decides a feast lasting seven days for all the people who are present in Shushan, from great to small, in the court of the garden of the king's palace. Clearly, to King Ahasuerus, anything worth doing is worth overdoing. 
And so an 180-day feast, the only thing better is to top it off with another seven-day feast. But this seven-day feast, we're given a little bit more description in. It's shorter in duration, just seven days, but what we read about the details is that this is an invitation to all great and small to come in and partake in this feast. And you have to ask, is this literal or just an exaggeration? Is, is the author just trying to tell us that there were so many people there? Or what, was he truly inviting great and small everybody? And how could you possibly house this many people? Well, according to a court physician, to Artaxerxes, his son or his grandson, the second, no less than 15,000 people often feasted at the table of Persian kings and the king of Assyria once had a celebration lasting 10 days for over 69,000 guests. So when we begin to wonder, is this even possible or fathomable to have a feast that could truly possess all the people within this city, great and small? Absolutely. And it just continues to paint this picture of how much wealth these people had, how many resources were at their expense. This was the ancient Burning Man kind of event, right? Filled with crowds as far as the eye could see. That People were given the freedom to drink as much as you wanted. Nobody was forced to drink. We read that according to the law. Nobody was forced under compulsion to drink, and yet there was an open bar. He said, you drink as much as you want. And not only that, every single cup they're given to drink with is a unique individual golden cup. And he doesn't skim on the drink either. We're told they're given the royal wine of the king. They're given the finest wine as much as they can drink with their own custom cup to do so in. And while you're there, have a seat in this gold couch. Enjoy the marble and the turquoise. Look at these beautiful curtains hanging with the most precious and valuable materials of purple, blue, fastened with cords of fine linen on silver rods with marble pillars. It's the most extravagant thing these people have ever seen. And as we'll see in a moment, these people, including the king, did not hold back from indulging in this open bar to the point of drunkenness. But while all this is taking place for these seven days, we read of an even third feast that is taking place at the very same time, and this is the feast being put on by Queen Vashti for the women. Now, to be honest, not much is known as to why she hosted this feast at this time for the women. There's a lot of speculation that can take place as to what was her motive and intention within this. Was there a message she was trying to convey? Is this already giving us a little insight into their relationship? We don't know for sure, and we want to be careful not to force a motive where we don't know one. But what we do know, if for nothing else, is that this detail continues to scream out to us the abundance within this kingdom that could throw so many feasts without any care for expense. This is a man who spends as much as he has and doesn't worry about balancing the checkbook every month. And it paints a very clear picture of the idols at play within this kingdom. The idol of pleasure, the idol of wealth, the idol of power, that throughout all of these feasts, there's no concern about the future, even tomorrow and what may come, as much as there is just a desire to enjoy all that we can get out of this very moment. Sound familiar? Well, on the seventh day of this feast that the king has held, we read that the heart of the king was merry with wine. That's a very nice way for the New King James Version to say that this guy was as drunk as a skunk. King Xerxes had tore, was tore up from the floor up. He's wearing his wobbly boots, we could say, and so many other terms to clearly paint a picture. This man is not in his right mind at this moment. 
And in this moment, when he's had far too much to drink and has partied for far too long, what does he decide? He's got a great idea. This was the ancient way of him saying, hey, hold my beer. Let me try something real quick. It's a bad idea. Nothing good is going to come from this grand idea of this drunken king. It's been said that the more alcohol that enters, the more wisdom that exits. And in this moment, this man has had an abundance of alcohol entering him, and there is no evidence of any wisdom coming out of him. His great idea is to bring Queen Vashti before all of these people in attendance, wearing her crown because she was beautiful to behold. You say, well, what's so wrong and and wicked about this? He's just appreciating how beautiful his wife is. Well, according to Jewish tradition, the request came from an argument that took place at this feast. Not hard to imagine a bunch of men drinking and binging for seven days, getting in a bit of a tuffle, but an argument around which country had the most beautiful women. And King Ahasuerus decided to settle the issue by putting his wife, the queen, on public display. Though not specifically said, it is assumed and believed by many different scholars This was a reference to an immodest display of her beauty before these men. In fact, some commentators even say that when you read the original, it actually seems that it's implying she was told to come out in her crown and nothing but her crown before all the people to be displayed. What we do know for sure is his motive mentioned is wrong regardless of what she was wearing, and that is to show her beauty to the people and officials Now, this isn't an appreciation of the beauty inside and outside of this woman made in the image of God. This is a lustful, shallow parading of her appearance for the pleasure of others and just to continue to build up the pride with this man. He wants to win an argument. He wants to prove he has the most beautiful woman in all the world. This has nothing to do with her. She's she's a pawn that he is using in a chess game against other men. And it's the exact opposite of what Ephesians commands a husband to do in the treatment of his wife. When Paul writes Ephesians 5.25, he gives a clear command to every husband that they are to love their wives. And all you have to do is quickly turn to when he wrote 1 Corinthians 13 to see a clear description of what does that love look like. And amongst the descriptions we're given there of this love that is patient and kind, we also read the description that love bears all things. The verb used for bears, that this love bears all things, it actually means to hide or conceal. It was used to describe a thatch or a covering over a building or shelter. And it speaks to a love that is demonstrated through covering or concealing the private matters, the faults from the public eye, and to cover that loved one from the dangers, embarrassments, and open shame that could come from exposure. Paul says this is what love looks like. In the same way that Jesus came and His blood has covered us of our sin and shame and washed us clean, it's the kind of love, Paul says, a husband should have for his wife. But what do we find here in our text with King Ahasuerus and Queen Vashti? The king openly exposing and parading his wife before the people. Gentlemen in the building today, love your wives, your sisters, your daughters, your mothers, and acknowledge their beauty both inside and out. Compliment your wives. Encourage your sisters, honor your mothers, but do not diminish their purpose and value given by God. First and foremost, these are God's daughters, which makes them princesses of the King of Kings. To be cared for, served, and protected with decency, kindness, compassion, and true love, as we read in 1 Corinthians 13. 
Their beauty runs deeper than their skin. Show them that you believe that. Their purpose goes further than their usefulness to you. Make space for that. And their presence in our lives is a gift that we should constantly be grateful for. Celebrate that. Because I have a daughter I'm raising. And when I tuck her in at night and I pray for her, I'm constantly praying that she grows up in a world where she is honored by men. That, that she understands where her beauty and value is found and that she finds her identity through the love of her heavenly Father and not the pursuit of an earthly man. And my desire is that we would be a church that raises all of our daughters this way, that treats all of our wives this way, that honors all of our mothers and elders this way, that we define beauty as God defines it, and we treat women with the respect and decency that God has called us to. <laughs> Amen. Michael Storrs is my paid cheerleader in the front, so I appreciate that. But this is the command that he gives to bring the queen. And it's important that we have that context because what we read is she flat out refuses him. She shuts him down. We read, but Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command. And we don't get the full reasoning behind this refusal, but we celebrate it. Because she just said to the king of kings by his own definition, heck no, tech no, I'm not coming. She did not allow the power of the king's command or the fear of the falling out for her refusal stop her from denying a wicked request. Ladies, learn from her example in this moment. Don't cave under pressure. Don't give in to the lustful and shallow requests of boys pretending to be men. What you win them with is what you win them to. And if you win them with a sexual desire and entice them with just looks and appearance, you can lose them just as quickly when they find it somewhere else. Let it be your heart and character and not your body and promiscuity that attract a man to you and cause him to appreciate your value and worth for the right things. Well, in this moment, Queen Vashti says, I'm not coming. Not going to do it. She sends the eunuchs back with a message that the king is not going to like to hear. And in fact, his response, we read, was that he was furious and his anger burned within him. Such embarrassment and shame in a moment when the man who's showing all of these people his authority and his power and his rule and his control and even his own queen won't respect him and listen to him in this moment. And everybody at the party, I'm sure, is having a little chuckle under their breath as they go, this guy can't even get his wife to do what he wants him to. But the author is letting you know something about this king, and more than just his dysfunctional marriage. King Ahasuerus was known for his temper. In fact, at one point in history, King Ahasuerus had a pontoon boat built over the Hellespont River in Greece. This bridge, this pontoon bridge, was built by 300 men, but then was destroyed by a storm that came through, and it also took out many of his ships with it. And in his anger in this moment and frustration, in his fury as it boils up, history tells us that he actually waded out into that ocean, and he started punching and beating the water, and even ordering the water to be whipped and chained by his men so that they took shackles and threw them into the water, and they took whips and began to whip the ocean. He even had some of his men declare curses over it and shame over the ocean because of what it had done to his bridge and his ships. But then he also took those 300 men responsible for building that bridge and had every one of them beheaded for their failed attempt. This is a little boy in a man's body with temper tantrums and a lack of self-control. 
And in a moment that he doesn't get what he wants, he lashes out in anger and fury. And here in our text, he looks to these wise men who understood the times, these men that would always be with him for his counsel, and says, what shall be done to Queen Vashti? What are we going to do to fix this problem? It's interesting that we read throughout the entire book of Esther, this king never seems to be making any decisions on his own. In fact, you often, often just see him kind of parading from party to party, from a drink to another drink, just kind of asking what should be done and then just going along with whatever people say. Nonetheless, in this moment, we do understand, as the text tells us, this was the custom of the king to have his highest officials consult in a difficult decision. And so he asks them, what should be the consequence for this queen disobeying the command of her king? Well, as they reason together, Memucan, one of these wise officials, comes forth with a solution to his problem. First, he acknowledges that Vashti has not only wronged the king, but also all the princes and all the people. They see this as a much bigger problem than just you and your wife, because now the whole kingdom is going to hear. Word is going to spread that the very queen denied the king. And now every single woman everywhere is going to start denying her husband's requests. They begin to feel like this is a much bigger deal than just Vashti, and so they conclude that an example must be made of her to send a message throughout the kingdom and all the lands of how we deal with situations like this when a queen won't respect her king. And so the king, in his embarrassment and shame, he heeds the counsel of Memucan, has her removed of her royal position with the intention of giving it to another better than she. And they conclude, in all their wisdom, this will set a tone across the kingdom, and everywhere wives will honor their husbands, both great and small. The obvious problem we see within this is that true honor and respect and submission are not gained through compulsion, threats, and power. Now, let's not ignore the fact that the desire for wives to honor their husbands is itself not a wrong desire. Back in Ephesians 5, verse 33, Paul makes clear an instruction given to wives that they are to respect their husbands. But this is given in the context of a husband who is loving his own wife as himself. Wives, give your husbands the respect he deserves. His calling is hard. His responsibility is great. And your support is crucial. And I promise you, the more you respect and honor that man, the more he will love you for it and be the man you desire to see. Husbands, give your wives the love she deserves. Her calling is often overlooked. Her responsibility is no less great, and your love and care is a necessary part of her ability to walk it out well. And I guarantee you, the more you love her as you love yourself, the more she will grow in her respect to you. And may we never be a church that consists of marriages on the rocks because both spouses refuse to give until they receive. What Dr. Emerson in his book calls a crazy cycle, where you want love and until you get it, you'll give no respect. And you want respect and so you're not going give to give love until you receive it. No, let's be a people who give respect even when we don't feel loved and a people who love even when we don't feel respected. And let's watch God as He strengthens and redeems marriages and uses those marriages that give sacrificially, unconditionally, to be an example and a light in a world that says, if it's not working for you, leave it. But in light of this wrongful decree sent out by a wicked ruler, under the banner of a good and virtuous attempt that wives would honor and respect their husbands, I just have to share with you something similar going on in our world today. 
Because I don't know if you're familiar with California Proposition 1 that is being brought before the courts and voted on in just a couple months. It's under the banner of the right to reproductive freedom, which once again does not in itself sound wrong at all. Sounds like something we would celebrate, but let me read to you what it declares. It says, the state shall not deny or interfere with an individual's reproductive freedom and their most intimate decisions, which includes their fundamental right to choose to have an abortion and their fundamental right to choose or refuse contraceptives. This section is intended to further the constitutional right to privacy guaranteed by Section 1 and the constitutional right to not be denied equal protection guaranteed by Section 7. Nothing herein narrows or limits the rights to privacy or equal protection. Now, what you didn't hear in there was any limitation to when, how, or at what stage a woman would have this right, thereby making full-term abortions not only legal, but by the definition here, an individual reproductive freedom in the most intimate decisions. And you see how deceiving and cunning the enemy can be. I mean, who doesn't want reproductive freedom? Who doesn't want equal protection guaranteed? Do you want to infringe upon a woman's constitutional right to privacy? Surely not. But all these great virtues are hiding the evil behind this banner of murdering innocent children even up to full term. I share this to bring an awareness of the fact that this was not something that just happened in Esther's day, that even now there are things being brought forth that desire to see abortion available all the way up to nine months of pregnancy. It's horrific. It's evil. It's wicked. And it's being done under the banner of bringing freedom and privacy and rights to women that they deserve. In the same way that we see a shameful, wicked king who's embarrassed by the denial of his wife, removing her place of authority only because she stood up for what truly was good and right. And we live in a day and age where people are declaring evil what is good and good what is evil. May we be a church that is awake and aware of the times we live in and are speaking out against things that are clearly evil. And here in our text, his decree goes forth. She's removed of her position. And before we get to chapter 2, he's going to go off to Greece to war. But as I invite the team to come back up, and as we bring the first chapter of Esther to a close, we see the scene and stage set for everything we will look at moving forward. A wicked king with unmatched power and riches and a broken system that honors immorality and punishes purity. And yet this will be the scene that God will use to bring good to his people and glory to his name. It is this very decree made from the pride and selfishness of this king that will be used to bring Esther into a place of prominence and set the stage for what God desires to do in saving his people. And as we find ourselves in a very similar place, under ungodly leaders with too much power and wealth and a broken system that honors immorality and punishes purity, it is often difficult to see how God could possibly use any of this, let alone all of this, for his good. But let's be a people who allow the story of Esther to rekindle our faith and encourage us to believe that which we cannot yet see. That if God could use a stage like this to work about an incredible saving of his people, that we would read today and be encouraged in our faith by, how much more could he use our current situation, the place in which we live, the times in which we find ourselves in for his glory? And as we spend an extended amount of time in worship and prayer this morning, I want to invite you to respond to whatever the Holy Spirit might be saying to you. 
Maybe it's the reality this morning that you've been on the receiving end of a broken system, feeling used and shamed, feeling abused and mistreated, feeling like Queen Vashti, you've been at the the wrong end of wicked men using you for their own selfish gain. My invitation to you this morning as there are people going to be available in the front and back of the room is to come and find healing through prayer and encouragement today. Maybe for others, you're being exposed to the reality of your own sin and pride in situations and you need to learn from the mistakes of this king and humble yourself today. Or maybe what you've never seen before you are recognizing now for the first time and it's the sand that your life has been built upon. You've built your life all around the foundation of the wrong things and you're feeling and recognizing the need this morning to build your life around something stronger, something more concrete and sturdy, something you can depend on. Please come and talk to myself or one of the people available to pray because we would love to talk with you. We would love to share with you how you can make the decision to give your life to Jesus, a sure and steady foundation so that no matter what you face in this life, you can be confident that if He is your foundation, you're on solid ground. But let's be a people that respond this morning to what the Lord is speaking. Doers of the word and not hearers only. For His glory and our good, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this reminder this morning through Esther chapter 1. That even when the wickedness and evil within our world seems out of control, seems unstoppable, Lord, we remember that you are the God who is working even when we don't see it. That you are the God who orchestrates all according to your will and your good pleasure. And you're a God who can move the hearts of the princes and kings however you see fit. And so, God, we pray that you would increase our faith this morning, that our story would be like Esther's story and where maybe before you were unseen, now we begin to see your hand at work. Now we begin to see your fingerprints within our life. And by faith, we believe you are doing things, good things. You are setting a stage for your glory. And God, we want to be obedient in these small moments. Lord, waken us up to what you're doing. Make us aware of the times we are living in, God, and the opportunities you have before us for such a time as this to be used as a part of your plan. Holy Spirit, would you convict, exhort, encourage, rebuke as you see fit this morning in our hearts? And would we be a people that act upon that conviction, that respond as you speak? that do a work in this room with you so that we might leave here better than we came in. We lay this time in your hands, and it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen.